Good morning, everybody. Morning, Verena. I'm glad you're there because you can do the first. Good morning, David. I just have to make it louder. Uh, well, we're going to make you quiet at the moment. Um, we're just going to mute you, but nothing personal. I can't find where you are, but I'll just from you here. Well, good morning, one and all. Welcome to those who are physically in St. Elizabeth's Church this morning. It's lovely to see you here. Uh, and again, a warm welcome to those who are looking in on Zoom, who may be looking on a little bit later uh, on Facebook, who are joining us at the moment on um, oh, whichever, whichever medium you are on. Um, it is lovely to see you here this morning. I hope this finds you well today and such a beautiful day. Um, the, the usual rules that have become the new normal apply, sadly, within the church building, we can't sing. Um, but we hope that those who are looking on from afar can join in, uh, sing as loud as you can and as loud as you want. When it comes to taking communion, communion is being prepared uh, with uh, hand gel, masks, etc. Uh, and um, it will be given in the church in one kind. That is, I will take uh, wine for all of us all together, and um, Lisa will come round and um, distribute a wafer to each person in the in, in the church. Uh, so please just say Amen, not at Rita, but uh, as I do, collectively, as it were. And of course, those who are on Zoom uh, may have further wine with them as well. I think that's all I need to say really now by way of introduction. Um, we're going to um, worship first of all with a video uh, reminding us that the Lord is our vision, be thou my vision. So wherever you are, however you are able, we worship together in song.
and with that in mind, so some liturgy as uh, we continue the, the, the beginning part of our service. We recognise afresh that we meet in the name of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, God is one. So we pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. So we say sorry to one another, to God, for those things that we know that we have done most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Mighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we have our reading and our talk reading this morning is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, starting at verse 21. The parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off, had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other's servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of the Lord.
May your word be a light to my feet and a lamp to my path. The words I speak be in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time of the church year, our readings are often parables. And today, we have one more. They are stories that invite us in and help us understand the teaching. Jesus was pretty fond of them too. About a third of Jesus's words recorded in the New Testament come to us in the form of a parable. It's a great way to teach because parables are at the same time incredibly simple and yet astonishingly deep, the more you think about them. Jesus told this parable because of a question. Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother when he sins against me? That's a good question, isn't it? But to understand it, let's focus on two words in that question. First, the word forgive. What does it mean to forgive someone? It means letting go, quite literally. The word for forgiveness in Greek means to let go. A closed fist, that's not a picture of forgiveness. This is forgiveness. It's unclenching the fist, letting go of the anger, letting go of a grudge. The second word I want you to focus on is the word brother. So Peter's not talking about strangers here. He's thinking about brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, colleagues, friends, neighbors, husbands, wives. People close to us are sometimes the one who can cause the most pain. Peter asked about sinning that is actually against me. He's talking about everything from the little daily annoyances of your partner to those moments of tremendous pain inflicted by lies, taking advantage of trust, whatever kinds of sin against you that makes that rage burn inside, that makes you want to hold on to hate and anger with a clenched fist. Peter asked, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother when he sins against me? And then he offers a guess. As many as seven times? Now, Jewish tradition suggested that forgiving someone three times was a good limit. So Peter, in his mind, is exceeding the standards of his day to meet the higher standards of Jesus. And seven was the number in the ancient world which suggested completeness and perfection. So it seemed like a really good suggestion a generous suggestion even. But Jesus, as usual, does more than exceed expectations. Not seven times, but I tell you, as many as 77 times. Some argue whether the original text means to say 70 times seven or 77, but the point is clear regardless. Jesus doesn't actually want us to count up to 77. He wants us to take the concept of complete forgiveness and multiply it with complete forgiveness. The point is, we should not be keeping account at all. He's saying that our forgiveness should not just exceed the standards of those around us, but should be infinite, both in number and quality, time after time after time. I can imagine the disciples looking around with eyebrows raised. Infinite forgiveness? That sounds ridiculous. That sounds like a really good way to get taken advantage of. In fact, it doesn't even sound right. Some grudges feel legitimate. There are really hard things to forgive, aren't there? Even forgiving someone seven times, as Peter suggested, seems impossible. Infinite forgiveness? That just doesn't make sense. But in Jesus's mind, it does. And so he explains, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. 
the amount of this money the first servant owed is beyond enormous. In comparison, 800 talents was probably about the total tax income of Palestine. Sorry, that's the accountant in me coming out. So this debt may have been greater than the amount of money in circulation in the region at the time. It's a shocking amount. I don't even know how somebody could be this far in debt. And unfortunately, the sale of people and property as punishment for a failure to pay a debt was commonplace in those days. And that is what would have naturally followed for this servant. Doing the calculations, even if he worked every day for the rest of his life, it would probably take over 160,000 years to pay it all back. Impossible. And that is what makes the next moment so incredible. The king does the unimaginable. He forgives the servant without any consequences. Forgiving such an enormous debt would have come at a great personal cost to the king. It's ridiculous to think of him forgiving such a debt. But when that servant came out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii and seizing him, began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. This second servant had a debt of a hundred denarii. One denarii was roughly a laborer's daily wage. So it was a sizable debt, about a third of a year's wages, but it's nothing compared to the first servants. The first servant owed 10,000 talents. Now bear with me, accountancy again, do the maths. One talent was worth 6,000 denarii. So the second servant's debt was 600,000 times smaller than the amount the first servant owed. And yet the first servant who had just walked out of the light of unimaginable mercy, having a debt of 10,000 talents freely let go, decides to choke his fellow servant for a comparatively microscopic debt. Be patient with me and I will pay you back. Sound familiar? Those are the exact same words the first servant spoke to the king, but he refused. At this point, I wonder if the first servant is even sane. Does he have amnesia? It's ridiculous for him not to forgive the second servant and just shockingly wrong. But that's the point. Refusing to forgive in light of unimaginable forgiveness is crazy. It doesn't make sense. This is why Jesus asks us for infinite forgiveness. The rabbis said to forgive three times. Peter suggested seven, and both seem quite generous by earthly standards. But Jesus's model for forgiveness doesn't operate according to this world. If you are a part of God's kingdom, you know that our king has forgiven the impossible debt that we owed. We could never have repaid our debt, not in a million lifetimes. In fact, in light of God's forgiveness, our refusal to forgive looks ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. In light of God's unimaginable mercy, our mercilessness would be a sign that we don't really grasp the forgiveness that we have experienced. It would be a total shock, an injustice, just as in this parable. And that's what makes the end of it so terrifying. You wicked servant, since no mercy is shown, no mercy is offered. And Jesus finishes by saying, that is what my heavenly father will also do to you, unless each one of you forgives his brother from his heart. Jesus told this parable in order to cut our consciences by placing God's forgiveness of us and our forgiveness of others into perspective. This is a parable about what happens to those who seek God's forgiveness for their sins, but won't let go of someone else's. This poison of your inner hate 
hurts your mental, physical, and emotional health. And it eats away at your spiritual health too. I see the King in mercy take a stand against all mercilessness and hatred. The parable becomes quite a different story. The meaning of God's anger towards the unmerciful servant slowly dawns. How serious he is about his forgiveness. And suddenly it all becomes clear. That poor blooded man strung up on the middle cross isn't just some criminal, but Jesus himself, the very one who told this parable. And though it pains that such a loving, innocent man should be condemned by God, I realize that this is the great sacrifice made so that we could go free. I know that my king is serious about forgiveness, serious enough to die for me. The degree to which we grasp our own shocking forgiveness, we will be able to forgive others. It's that simple. I'm not saying it's going to be easy though, especially when that letting go is something we are supposed to do in our heart. When your heart feels like a hardened fist, it's hard to let go. But if you can simply trust the fact that in Christ, you are forgiven infinitely, then you're going to want to let go of all those grudges so that God can pour his forgiveness into your open hands. And his forgiveness will fill your hands so full that you won't have any room left to hold on to hate or anger. In fact, you'll be so preoccupied with the shocking forgiveness that you're holding, you wouldn't dare set it aside to hold on to a worthless grudge. We have all been sinned against. There are grudges that feel legitimate. And if you were living according to this world, you would have every right to hold on to them. But we are aiming to be part of the kingdom of God. And here in his kingdom, forgiveness is what we should do best. Our king is infinitely merciful and anything less just doesn't make sense. Thank you, Sarah. Should we just keep a moment or two silence as we reflect on um, what Sarah's been talking of this morning? So let us proclaim together what we believe as we say together the words of the creed. That we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, and of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So we turn to some prayers of intercession and Farina is going to lead us in that. Marina, can you hear us? Marina, you need to just unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Although Holy Cross Day is celebrated tomorrow, I would like to reflect on it today because it is a day which honors and commemorates the sacrifice of love that Jesus Christ made on the cross for our salvation of love. O oh Lord, hear my prayer. O oh Lord, hear my prayer. When I call, answer me. O oh Lord, hear my prayer. O oh Lord, hear my prayer. Come and listen to me. We adore you, dear Lord, and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. This morning we ask you to bless all in your ministry, especially our Archbishop Justin and Bishops Ruth and Will, also those who lead the church's worship. By preaching of the word, and the celebration of the sacraments. So please give to Christian people a deep longing to take up their cross and so to draw all people close to you, wherever they may be. By our Saviour's cross and passion, Lord, save us and help us. Looking mercy upon the world you loved so much, that you sent your son to suffer and to die. Please help all in authority to witness to the faith we have received by our actions and our deeds. So make us a caring world, strengthen all nations, including our own, to work for justice, peace and reconciliation. Lord, save us and help us. Make us a responsible community, supporting our families, friends and neighbours during this lockdown. Bless all teachers for their dedication and keep children safe and well as they have gone back to school once more. So we pray that you will renew our commitment to your loving in all our relationships, wherever we may be. Lord, save us and help us. Bring healing to all who are weighed down by pain and injustice. Help the persecuted, the lonely, the suffering, the ones affected by the coronavirus and the dying to find strength in your comfort. We also pray for the homeless, the ones on the edge of society, and all who need our prayers today. Lord, save us and help us. And now welcome into paradise all who have left this world in your friendship. According to your promises, bring them with all your saints to share in the benefits of Christ's death and resurrection. By our Saviour's cross and passion, Lord, save us and help us. And finally, dear Lord, make known your saving ways upon earth, your saving power among all nations. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
keep a ring up. So we're going to share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. Um, let me just introduce that with a a short piece of liturgy, and then in a very socially distanced manner, manner we will share a sign of Christ's peace. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. So with you. Help for one another, a sign of Christ's peace. Peace, peace be with you. Peace, peace, be, with peace you. be with you, everyone. Peace be with you. And I love Facebook. Facebook, YouTube, everybody. Zooming and to those on Facebook and clicking on a little bit later on YouTube. Peace. Oh, dear. So we celebrate communion together. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Almighty God, good Father to us all, your face is turned towards your world. In love, you gave us Jesus, your son, to rescue us from sin and death. Your word goes out to call us home to the city where angels sing your praise. We join with them in heaven's song, saying together, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed Christ. Father of all, we give you thanks for every gift that comes from heaven. To the darkness, Jesus came as your light. With signs of faith and words of hope, he touched untouchables with love and washed the guilty clean. This is his story. This is our song. Hosanna in the highest. The crowds came out to see your son, yet at the end they turned on him. On the night he was betrayed, he came to table with his friends to celebrate the freedom of your people. This is his story. This is our soul. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus blessed you, Father, for the food. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it and said, this is my body given for you all. Jesus then gave thanks for the wine. He took the cup, gave it and said, this is my blood shed for you all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. This is our story. This is our soul. Hosanna in the highest. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate the cross on which he died to set us free. Defying death, he rose again and is alive with you to plead for us and all the world. This is our story. This is our song. Hosanna in the highest. Send your spirit on us now. That by these gifts we may feed on Christ with opened eyes and hearts on fire. May we and all who share this food offer ourselves to live for you and be welcomed at your feast in heaven. For all creation worships you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. So we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So however you are able, draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts, by faith, with thanksgiving. The body of Christ. Blood of Christ. So let us say together. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. 
may we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free. And the whole earth live to praise your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. That brings our service of Holy Communion to a close. We need to say farewell to those who are looking on via Facebook live stream and those who have been watching via uh, YouTube. Farewell to you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in this way again next week. A reminder to all that if you 